Good morning or afternoon. And thank you for joining us today. I'm George Frampton. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlanta Council's Global Energy Center, where I'm uh, initiating a new program called the Transatlantic Climate Policy Program. We hope that this session today uh, will be the first in a series of conversations highlighting local perspectives uh, from coal impacted communities in the US as our nation makes a transition to clean energy. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This event is on the record. We're currently live streaming to Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, it'll be recorded. We encourage you to post about the discussion and share it on social media using the hashtag AC Energy and tagging us at AC Global Energy. If you're on uh, Zoom and you'd like to participate in the conversation, you can submit questions through the Q&A portal at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll try to respond to as many as we can, but that's only for people who are on the Zoom channel. So our program, there's a growing recognition of the need to address the energy transitions impact on workers and communities who produce the fossil fuels uh, on which our country has relied and built its prosperity. There's been periodic uh, federal funding of economic development in coal communities. It's occurred in the past, uh, but I would say with varying degrees of both success and uh, often, if not usually in the absence of, of community input. At the state and local level, however, there are many local organizations and leaders taking a variety of entrepreneurial initiatives to position these communities for prosperity and a clean energy future. And in our view, any national policy to be effective should really look first to these local voices to assess what can work best. And that's what today is about. One source of this presentation today is an initiative started last year by an organization, Partnership Responsible Growth, which I co-founded, working jointly with the National Wildlife Federation to reach out to local voices in coal country. Linda Lance, who's now uh, an Atlantic Council consultant, directed that program. And the work resulted, in, among other things, in a coal country source book describing dozens of local leaders' programs, how to reach them and what they're doing, which uh, you can find. We provided a link to the source book uh, in the invitation to this event, and we'll mention it later. So we're going to start today with two DC-based experts, and then hear from four uh, uh, very impressive and creative local leaders. The two, I'll start with the DC uh, participants. Jason Walsh, first, is executive director of the Blue Green Alliance, and he led the development uh, at the White House at, in the Obama administration's second term of the Power Plus initiative, which was designed to assist coal miners and coal communities. Uh, and, and in doing that, he, he built on extensive work with local stakeholders. Second, Adele Morris is gonna talk at the, from the Brookings Institution. She's worked extensively with local groups on the economics of coal industry, coal communities, She's written a lot on and provided a lot of invaluable data about the, the prospects for economic growth in these communities. So Jason, uh, I'll start with you and, and then go to Adele uh, when you're finished. Thanks. Thank you, George. Uh, it's good to be here uh, and good to be here with all of you in this weirdly disembodied way. Um, so as George said, I, I, I am the executive director of, of the Blue Green Alliance. We're a coalition of labor unions and environmental organizations uh, that was, was started by our two original odd bedfellows, the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers Union back in 2006. We now encompass uh, 13 uh, environmental organizations and labor unions. Um, I, I mean, I like background music when I'm talking, but uh, thank you. Um, but I, uh, I also come to this panel as someone, and George mentioned this uh, as well, uh, who had the privilege of working within the federal government during uh, the Obama administration, where I was tasked with developing a, a strategy for how, 
frankly, the, the administration could do a better job of responding to what was a, a hell of a lot of economic pain uh, impacting workers and communities uh, in coal country as they were grappling with the move away from uh, the use of coal, particularly in the power sector. Um, uh, that resulted in the, the, the power initiative, which was a, a cross uh, agency coordinated effort. It ultimately involved 10 different federal agencies. Uh, and what we did was to try our best to um, align and uh, target and scale up investments, primarily using federal economic and workforce development dollars um, in coal communities uh, and in workers uh, dislocated uh, from both coal mines and, and coal fire power plants. Um, in that role, I was struck over and over uh, again by how uh, valuable I found the input from uh, leaders, local leaders in, in coal country um, who had been grappling with and developing solutions to these challenges for quite some time <laughs> before I arrived on the scene. Uh, th this, um, this fact should surprise exactly no one uh, who's listening to this panel, um, but it is striking and, and I think worth further conversation how little this kind of feedback loop, right, of local leaders to national leaders and policymakers is, is actually institutionalized. Um, so we should talk about how to do that. Um, the, um, I think it's fair to say the power initiative achieved some successes. Uh, we got to invest in some really good organizations uh, and good projects, uh, some of whom are represented on this call today. Um, but let's be honest, it was essentially a jury rigged <laughs> kind of Rube Goldberg-like contraption, right? I mean, we were primarily trying to use existing resources and existing authorities, um, uh, which really didn't allow us uh, to make investments at the scale necessary uh, to uh, address the need that we saw in these uh, communities, and which relied on executive action, right? Uh, led by a president uh, who uh, valued science uh, and data and truth. Uh, President Trump, it, it may uh, go without saying, values none of these things, right? And um, when he took office, the power initiative was abandoned. And in the Trump administration's first budget submitted to Congress, over a billion dollars in cuts total were proposed to the very federal programs that we use, that we relied on the most under the power initiative to deliver aid to these communities and these workers, including the proposed outright elimination of both the Appalachian Regional Commission and the Department of Commerce's uh, Economic Development Administration. For fortunately, uh, on a bipartisan basis, those uh, cuts were rejected by Congress. Um, this was uh, coupled uh, with efforts by the Trump administration to uh, prop up the coal industry using, um, attempting to use authorities they didn't actually have to force consumers to buy power from coal-fired generators. Uh, these efforts failed, predictably, uh, and, and the coal industry has continued to decline over the course of the Trump administration. There are various metrics we can use to, to illustrate that, that continued decline. One I will note is, is the fact that um, if, if we compare the number of coal miners working in, in this country from the start of 2017 through the first half uh, of this year, we see a decline in coal mine employment of close to 20%, um, which might explain why uh, over the recent election season, we did not see uh, the president uh, surround himself with coal miners uh, as political props. Uh, as he did uh, four years ago. Um, we are now in December of 2020. Uh, Joe Biden will be president in about six weeks, despite the disgraceful uh, efforts by the president and his enablers to sabotage the will of the people. Um, and among the policy positions taken by the president-elect, is a stated commitment to, in his words, 
fulfill an obligation to the workers and communities who powered our industrial revolution and decades of economic growth, uh, workers and communities in coal country. There are concrete ideas for how to fill that up, fulfill that obligation that had been for, put forward by a number of groups, including BGA, uh, as part of the, the National Economic Transition Platform, as well as a blueprint uh, from the Reimagine Appalachia Coalition, both, both of which you'll hear more about uh, from our panelists today. Uh, so that is all to say that this conversation could not be better timed. Right? Uh, and this, this group of panels could not be better uh, chosen. These are all folks working on the front lines uh, in coal country to build uh, a, a better, more sustainable economic future for those communities. Um, let me make two, two more points uh, wearing my hat uh, as an advocate uh, for workers before passing this over uh, to Adele. One, you, you may hear the term just transition used during this panel. It's a good term. I use it myself. It's recognized internationally. Um, but despite the fact that it actually came out of the labor movement, um, many in labor view it skeptically, right? They will observe uh, rightly <laughs> that there has not been a transition that is just for workers in this country, uh, certainly over the last few decades as we've gone through job loss as the result of bad trade policy and automation and gigification. So important to keep that in mind. Second, to, to do this transition fairly, this energy transition, we can't only focus on minimizing the pain for workers and communities, right? Although we have to do that. We also have to maximize the gain for workers <laughs> and communities, right? By uh, delivering good jobs preferably high quality, preferably union, uh, and by making targeted investments uh, into the communities that, that um, to paraphrase the president-elect, have um, helped to power this country for a very long time. So on that note, let me uh, turn the mic over to my uh, colleague, Adele Morris. Adele. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, George. And thanks to the Atlantic Council for hosting this event. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the folks who live in coal country and really are, are much better positioned than I to speak to the lived experience of folks there. But what I wanna talk about to kind of launch our discussion is what, what the data tell us. You know, if coal country folks are suffering, that is validated by the data. It's validated by historical, uh, facts, and it's also validated by projections uh, going forward. So just a, a few, few kind of facts and figures to get us started. Now, there's an energy transition where if we're going to try to achieve a, a stabilized climate, we need to reduce and indeed eliminate greenhouse gas emissions on net. So but why do we focus on coal? Because there are multiple fossil fuels. The reason we're talking about coal today and why the concerns in coal country are so acute is the role that coal plays in the power sector. Nearly all coal produced in the United States goes into the power sector. There's a little bit that goes to um, metallurgical and other industrial uses, but the vast majority is used in the power sector. And what we know from the economics is that um, Coal has lots of substitutes, right? There's natural gas, there's renewables, that renewables have started to get much less expensive than they used to be. And natural gas prices are far lower than they used to be. And why coal is sort of um, important and unique is that per unit of energy, coal has about twice as much carbon as natural gas. So what that means is if you're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you get a real big bang for your buck if you substitute away from coal, either to natural gas or to renewables. And that's been happening. But in fact, it hasn't been happening because we care about climate. It's been happening because the relative costs of these other fuels has gone down so much. And we know that actually from very careful econometric analysis. You know, I think there was a lot of rhetoric about how the Obama administration had a war on coal and all this sort of stuff. But 
but the declines we've seen in coal use are really driven by supply and demand and prices of coal substitutes. And in addition to that, because coal also emits other air pollution like sulfur dioxide, when utilities are regulated for traditional air pollutants, coal gets another disadvantage. So, you know, just since in the last 10 years, coal's gone from 45% of the power generated, and now it's projected this year to be only 20% of the power generated. So that's losing a lot of market share. And that's what's happened already. So we're already in this transition. But now what comes next, if we're pursuing any kind of cost-effective climate policy or that of any significant ambition, Coal is going to be the first thing that goes because, because again, it has so many substitutes that are cleaner and it's right on the margin now of being uneconomic and it just isn't going to take much to, to tip it towards, um, you know, further retirements of coal. And, and with it go the jobs and the economic activity in coal reliant areas and and just to, just to illustrate, some of the projections is if we have even a modest, say, price on carbon or clean electricity standard, the numbers suggest that the coal production in the Powder River Basin, for example, could fall by 95% in only five years. So this is extremely rapid. That's not a transition. That's a wholesale dislocation. So for, for state and local governments, it, it's beyond time to be prepared for this. And you're not gonna necessarily be able to do it all by yourselves. You're gonna need federal help. And so that, so we want, I wanna get to the solutions, but just a few other observations. When coal companies go bankrupt, they leave behind a big mess, literally and figuratively. So they're supposed to have, be paying for miners' retirement and healthcare benefits, but they can discharge those liabilities in bankruptcy court. The same thing can happen with their mine reclamation liabilities. They're supposed to be cleaning up these mines and reclaiming them back to uh, as good a condition as when the mines were first developed. But if they go through bankruptcy, they don't necessarily need to do that. And unfortunately, some of the state governments have not been as uh, vigorous as they should have in ensuring that these companies have posted bonds that can cover all that stuff. Furthermore, what happens is these companies have figured out how to delay paying their taxes. And these are severance taxes and royalties and, and property taxes and sales taxes and all kinds of different fiscal instruments that, that are directly or indirectly related to coal production. And so then the local governments have to go and enter into the bankruptcy proceedings to try to get their money. So all of this just creates an extraordinary burden on the workers and the communities and the, and the governments. So we need to see this coming and be prepared for it. And in addition, as coal production shrinks, all that revenue related to coal starts drying up. And this is important in several dimensions. At the federal level, it's important because coal-related taxes fund the Black Lung Disability Trust Fund. Well, who's going to need that? Everybody who's been disabled from working in the mines. And they're not going to be able to get it from the companies because they're going to be bankrupt. So to have benefits for those workers, we're going to need some additional funds for, for those kinds of services. Um, in addition, the local governments who, who are in receipt of these severance taxes, where is, where is their replacement revenue going to come from? So there's so many dimensions to this transition and so many challenges. I think we really need to think about how the federal government can intervene and prepare and support these local governments and communities um, as they try to, you know, deal with the economic rug being pulled out from under them. 
And it's, it's not so easy to do, but I figure the sooner we start, the better. And so I, I focused on the mining communities, certainly the, the communities that rely on coal-fired power plants, some of them are in the same situation and they're scattered all over the country. And those, in, especially in rural areas where there's not a lot of other job opportunities right in those places, will face very similar challenges to, to the coal mining areas. So uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I, I love to hear about solutions. I think the Power Plus program was extremely well intended and they were doing as best they could cobbling together those resources as Jason was describing. But I think it was small potatoes compared to what's really needed and what will what will be necessary and what will be fair to the folks. Because it, especially if we have climate policy that accelerates this transition, I think it behooves us all to support workers and communities through that process in a way that that we can all be proud of. And I'll turn it back to Jason. Thank you, Adele. Um, so it's, it's now my pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, Brandon Dennison is the founder and CEO of Coalfield Development in Wayne, West Virginia, uh, which is creating a new model of social entrepreneurship and job training. Jill Morrison is the executive director of the Powder River Basin Resource Council in Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, Wyoming is actually the, the country's largest coal producer and is now facing uh, a decline in its economy, including a likely crash in state and local government revenues, which Joe will talk more about. Amanda Woodrum from the great state of Ohio uh, is the senior researcher at uh, Policy Matters Ohio, uh, one of the, the founders of the Reimagine Appalachia Coalition. She'll discuss uh, that coalition's blueprint for building a 21st century Appalachia beyond coal. And uh, Emmett Pepper is the executive director of Energy Efficient West Virginia, working to ensure affordable energy for Appalachia and energy efficiency efforts as a job creator in the area. We are very pleased uh, to have you all with us today to share your perspectives. And Brandon, we're gonna start with you. Great, well, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity and thank you everybody who, who's listening in. This is um, a topic near and dear to my heart. I'm born and raised in West Virginia. I can say um, this is our organization's 10 year anniversary. We started in 2010. Um, and there's a greater acceptance that th this transition is happening. Uh, I, I've seen it and felt it in the first 10 years. Folks are still, by and large, not too happy about it, but uh, there is an acceptance that it's happening, and, and I'm seeing what I like to call an entrepreneurial movement of lots of entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders, uh, local government leaders, oftentimes younger folks like myself, who know this place's potential is so much greater uh, than, than what we've realized so far, who know that we can be more than just one thing and are ready to lead the way to a newer, better economy. But we do need bigger investments at larger scale uh, to be able to, to get where we want to go. And so the perspective from Southern West Virginia right now is that a lot of people are, are struggling. Um, it's, it's just an extended, prolonged period of of tough times. We have a substance use disorder epidemic. Uh, even before the, this COVID pandemic, we felt like we were in a public health crisis um, with, with addiction and with overdoses. That is directly linked to the hopelessness that comes from living in a place that has a, a distressed economy. And I think something that gets lost in the coal discussion is if you look at a lot of coal communities or even extraction-based economies, around the world, a, a lot of them have something in common, which is generational poverty. So even when coal was booming, we, we lagged the, the nation in, in uh, income and uh, education rates and uh, wealth generation. And so as scary as this time is, and it is scary and it is tough, uh, a lot of those entrepreneurs from the bottom up that I'm talking about do see this as an opportunity to build something newer and better, but again, that will take significant investments. I do believe the Power Plus program was a great start. And, and my favorite thing about the Power Plus program was it identified those local leaders and invested directly in those local leaders. So 
I, I think a lot of times the just transition conversation, it, it, it gets framed as starting new big governmental programs. And again, I don't want to mix messages. We need big public investment uh, to have a fair transition. But the way that that gets done is really, really important. And there are local leaders and there are local entrepreneurs and there are good ideas on the ground that are rooted here and committed here and of this place and, and the people that are born and raised here um, that just with enough investment can, can lead the way from the bottom up. And Power Plus set a good precedent on that. Uh, we, just need, we just need more and we need bigger. So um, I'm happy to, to answer questions later on. Uh, I think the world of everybody uh, on this panel, just some amazing leaders. And uh, I will say also that Coalfield Development, we are involved with the Just Transition Fund which has laid out a national energy transition platform, NET. Uh, and that platform, uh, by and large, there are leaders from native reservations, leaders from the East, from the West. And the big theme out of that platform uh, also is honoring local leaders, building that local capacity, uh, and making sure we do this as, as bottom up as possible. Great, on, on to you, Jill. Thank you very much. Uh, I really uh, appreciate being here. Um, I really thank Adele Morris and Linda Lance who were in Wyoming about a year ago uh, presenting and talking with people to get the lay of the land here. And Wyoming is kind of uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, I'll start with the bad, which um, we, Wyoming is in a crisis. And that crisis right now with the decline of coal is only going to get much worse. Um, we have already a huge budget deficit. We're struggling to figure out how to fund our schools and many other of our state agencies facing deep cuts. Uh, the ugly is that many of our leaders are still in denial um, and want to try to save coal and are doubling down on investing millions of dollars in uh, carbon capture uh, technology, which is unproven, very expensive, uh, trying to force utilities who are uh, proposing to retire coal plants into having to uh, not close them, but add a experimental unproven technology. Um, the good is actually that the majority of the population in the state realizes the sees the handwriting on the wall and realizes that we have got to come together and move forward a transition into a new economy in this state and into a diversified economy, not an economy that is 75% uh, based on fossil fuel income. And so there is a lot of discussion, a lot of movement at the local level um, in transition coming from the small communities and the towns moving towards a renewable base economy. In fact, what has been saving communities in this time are wind projects that are being built. That's where people are being employed. That's the tax revenue that is helping. Um, what we really need is uh, the incentives uh, to bring on board the deniers uh, in the local communities. We need that funding that can come from a coordinated, well thought out mechanism at the federal level to backfill those lost revenues, money that will go into an infrastructure to support diversification to help those coal miners who are losing their jobs get job retraining uh, that will at the same time help our community colleges who can provide that type of training. We really need the reauthorization of the abandoned, abandoned mine land fund um, and, and uh, assistance to assure that those bonds and those securities because you know, every, every few months, another companies, we just had a company this past week file bankruptcy, it's affecting Wyoming. Um, we need to make sure that the bonding and the securities and sureties are there 
that will assure we get reclamation. And those are gonna be also jobs for miners. Uh, another area that, that's of concern to us that needs some examination and maybe reform are these 45Q tax credits. Those are being used in a way that seems illegitimate in many ways. That's what's pushing forward this, some of these carbon capture technology schemes that is concerning uh, and, and moving that momentum. Um, we do, as I said, have many uh, in local government, local communities who are not in the state of denial, but trying to embrace and move forward. The younger generation is coming into lead in Wyoming, and uh, I think that's very helpful. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to offer. And again, I thank you and appreciate being part of the discussion. Thank you, Jill. Amanda, you're up next. All right. Thanks, Jason. So can you hear me? Great. As you all know, there are significant implications for Appalachia from national climate change and energy transition legislation, whatever form it takes. And as you all know, Appalachia is and will continue to be a political stumbling block for national climate solutions until we figure out what the region, AKA coal country, needs. Fortunately, the answer is actually quite simple. We need an Appalachian climate infrastructure program, one tailor-made for the region. With the right federal investments, Appalachia can actually do its part to become carbon neutral, but we'll do it our way. Reimagine Appalachia, a coalition of community labor and environmental leaders in the region dedicated to achieving a 21st century sustainable Appalachia, as well as shared prosperity in the region, has already done the hard work of creating a collective vision for the region and a blueprint for how we get from where we are to where we need to go. And we did it in the context of significant federal resources that it's going to take to help get us there. In essence, what we've written is a new deal that works for us in this region. And let me be clear, this is not about retraining and relocating our skilled workforce for jobs they don't want in places they don't want to go or putting our workforce into early retirement. Although of course, those that are ready re to retire uh, should be able to do so with dignity, with access to their pensions and healthcare. But Appalachia is union strong. We have skilled workers trained in a network of stellar union apprenticeship programs. They have foundational skills and these foundational skills make them ready and able to pivot to the work that needs to be done to build a 21st century sustainable Appalachia. In fact, we need those workers. We need them to help build the future that we want to live in. The bottom line, Appalachia has fueled the prosperity of the rest of the nation for centuries while itself has suffered in poverty. Too many of Appalachia's communities rank in the bottom 10% of the nation for high unemployment, high rates of poverty, and low incomes. Centuries of extractive industry practices and absentee corporations have exploited our workforce, left our land scarred, and our workers and our neighbors sick. Frankly, with our abundance of natural resources in Appalachia, we should be the richest region in the nation, but we're not. We're the poor. We are the poorest. In a federal Appalachian climate infrastructure program, if well designed, actually represents an opportunity to reverse course and build shared prosperity in the region. 
and we believe Appalachia deserves its fair share of federal resources allocated for climate solutions. We deserve it. We deserve infrastructure investments to build a regional economy based on local wealth creation and not enriching absentee corporations. Appalachia wants and needs all the things everybody else wants. We want investments to modernize our electric grid, including building out universal broadband. We want investments to repair the damage from the last century of extractive industry practice. That includes investments to, uh, to re and reviving the Civilian Conservation Corps to reforest the region, to reclaim our abandoned mine lands, and to remediate brownfields at shuttered coal plants. In fact, we also need federal funds to repurpose shuttered coal plants and those that are continue to be shuttering into industrial parks that are environmentally friendly, AKA eco industrial parks. We also want investments to promote local farmers and regenerative agricultural practices rather than big ag and their land degrading practices. And we've done the math. These investments will create hundreds of thousands of jobs in Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Good union jobs in coal country. One last but very important piece of the puzzle, these federal investments need to come with strings attached labor and community standards. That way we can ensure they are spent the right way in a way that maximizes the benefit to the community. That means strong federal guidance on these public dollars to ensure one, the jobs created are good union jobs equivalent to those in fossil fuel industries. Two, that coal workers are given priority for the jobs created to ensure genuine opportunities for fossil fuel industry workers. And three, that black workers and other workers of color have access to these good union jobs. And you can do that via requirements to use union apprenticeship on the job. And that the percentage that a percentage of those union uh, apprentices come from low income communities. And you can build all of this work on the local community benefit movement that has grown to national proportions. They've figured out much of what needs to be done here. Specifically, look to the Partnership for Working Families. They have built a wealth of best practices um, that to ensure that public dollars spent for economic development purposes are done in a way that's good for union workers, communities of color, as well as environmental advocates. We just need to figure out how to turn these best practices into federal policy guidance. Uh, and for that purpose, I recommend putting the Partnership for Working Families on your speed dial. And that's my spiel. Thank you for that good spiel, Amanda. Uh, Emmett, you're the cleanup hitter. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you can hear me okay, right? Yep. Um, uh, so I appreciate uh, you, the opportunity to be here today. And um, as you said, I, I am the cleanup hitter. Uh, I'm also an attorney. Um, and something that we like to do as attorneys is uh, when we make complaints, we say, I would like to incorporate everything else I just said into my statements now. So I'd like to incorporate everything that was just said into what I'm saying. I'm 100% behind uh, everything that I, that I heard so far and I feel honored to be part of this uh, small group of, of really important leaders. Um, you know, so we work on, uh, we're primarily a policy oriented uh, organization, do some work on, at the local level, um, uh, local governmental policies, uh, but we primarily work on utility regulation, but we also do a lot of, uh, do some lobbying at the state level. And um, while I, I think a lot about, um, you know, how to best engage and involve the public and how to best be uh, respectful. And I think I, I really uh, liked some of the things that Brandon said about 
making sure we're plugging in with local organizations. Um, and there's also been a lot of uh, workforce development discussions um, in this area. I think that's all important. Um, but I also have to say that having sat through several legislative sessions at this point, um, up close and personal dealing with um, some of our legislators and um, uh, Jill touched on this and similarly in Wyoming, I, I think that there is a need to incentivize uh, better local policies as well, which maybe is contrary to what uh, this kind of, let's listen uh, a little bit more. But, uh, you know, I think back to the Energy, po energy Policy Act of 2005, which um, resulted in better energy codes in states, um, an area I work in, and uh, renewable portfolio standards, and et cetera. And so there are, um, of course, there were some loopholes, and ours were wasn't very strong, but th there are opportunities there uh, to just incentivize states to do better. Um, and so, how do we how do we pick those policies? Um, you know, I think um, there are plenty of states that are already doing uh, really great work around sustainability. Uh, it makes my job really easy. Uh, working to advocate for energy efficiency, I just have to look at the uh, forty seven other states that are ahead of us in the uh, ranking of energy efficiency policies nationally. So uh, there are similar other policies that we can be looking at to help grow sustainability. And that will naturally help with the transition aspect, I believe. Um, and so without getting into like some of the, the specifics of what I see as uh, the specific policies that we should advocate for, um, you know, some principles that I think of are um, leveraging local private uh, free market forces and adding to those. So matching and, and those sorts of things. I, I think about utility um, energy efficiency programs, for instance, or those sorts of things. Um, allow open participation from local businesses. So I think using the lo local uh, leaders is important, but also some something that just a local business can take part in. They're gonna build, they can build the, their own workforce. Um, in order to take the advantage of the federal dollar. So um, just a little sidebar, you know, in my world, we work uh, a lot on weatherization issues and um, a lot of that money goes to community action agencies that are private, that are nonprofits that have regions and such. And, and so having, allowing more uh, utilization of the private sector in that area, I think would be good. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, just putting the incentives in that require, um, states to enact things like um, standards and um, improving, you know, for, for me, so the work I do, energy efficiency helps people save money, helps people live their lives more cost effectively. So um, it, it really isn't a, a burden. It's just a matter of um, uh, making sure that we're, we're doing what is going to save people money. And the last thing I would say is that is asking states to really think about the, think about how to plan and think about planning, uh, put together the kind of plans that are um, going to be to incorporate all the principles that the other panelists have talked about. Um, today, there was a report released by the WVU School of Law that, that uh, and others that, um, that kind of started to look at, well, how do we look at power plants and in, uh, in a zero carbon world? How do we transition away from some of the coal-fired power plants? Those sorts of uh, discussions I think will be will be useful going forward and I think I'm over time um, or we're all over time I guess so I'll, I'll stop it there. We, you're right Emmett we are uh, all over time it's a collective problem and and as is, is often the case with panels like this we have more good questions than we have time to answer but let's let's take a crack. So there I'm gonna, and I'm gonna do my best here to kind of uh, group a few of these. So there are a couple of questions around what kind of jobs are available in coal communities, you know, to, to what extent are renewable energy jobs uh, actually real in these communities. Um, uh, a, a significant issue with population uh, loss and a sort of corresponding question about how, how do you keep people in these communities. Um, let, let's start there and, and, and maybe I'll ask uh, Brandon to, to kick that off. 
Sure thing. So Coalfield Development, we start new uh, sustainable businesses and we also invest in other um, sustainable businesses. We helped start the first solar installation company in Southern West Virginia. It's now a completely for-profit uh, viable company of more than 40 employees. They are uh, a part of the electrical union. Uh, so these are good quality jobs. And um, so we also, we have an agriculture company. Uh, we have a construction company, which is a free apprenticeship with the carpenters union. We've done a furniture making company uh, in the wood shop. So I, I, I want to build up what Amanda said, which is a lot of the skills, the hands-on skills that are going to be needed to retool our economy uh, do come nat coal communities, east and west and otherwise. Uh, folks tend to have those types of skills that are needed to install solar panels, set up uh, uh, wind power stations, retrofit buildings that need to be more energy efficient. Um, and, and what's exciting too is a lot of times folks say, well, what can replace the coal jobs? And I think that's the wrong question because a lot of our problem is we are overly dependent on this one extractive industry for so long. And we put all our eggs in that one basket and now we're paying for it. So the answer is, you know, what are, what are the industries, plural, that can replace coal? Um, so renewables have real potential. I think former mountaintop removal sites make a ton of sense. Uh, as commercial scale um, renewable energy site locations. Um, the tourism industry is one of the fastest growing industries around. Local food, amazing movement and growth in local food, uh, value added agriculture products. And there's a manufacturing, uh, again, hands-on skill set here that's only begun to be tapped, uh, the potential of that. Thank you, uh, Brennan. That's an excellent answer. And, and unfairly, I'm going to just keep rolling with, with questions here because there's so many good ones. Uh, I'm going to single out one uh, uh, from uh, Hunter Cornfiend. The increase in the U.S. coal bankruptcies over the past two years has disproportionately affected workers through frozen health benefits, underfunded pensions, bounce checks. What needs to be done from both a state and federal level to better protect workers through the bankruptcy process? Excellent question. Anyone want to take a crack at answering that? I'll take a crack at it, Jason. Yep. Um, it's, it's really unfair what's been happening to workers because what happens is the, the companies pay their executives m hundreds of millions of dollars and then leave you know, the people who have done the bulk of the work high and dry. And we need to reform that process or we need some really go-getter um, attorneys under Uner Uniform Fraudulent Transfers Act to go after some of those monies. I mean, the way bankruptcy is structured is, is really, I, I would say it's corrupt and, and we need to change the way it's structured. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's too late for many and so, there needs to be a way to make those people whole with their health benefits, their pension, their retirement. And that is what we owe those miners for all their years of hard work. You know, those corporations owe them that, but, you know, I, I don't know if we can get it out of them. Thank you, Jill. Any, any other quick responses to that question? Uh, a couple of questions here, and since it was the first question from Jeff Young, I'll just, I'll repeat it. What indications do you see that the incoming administration will make a, quote, just transition for coal dependent communities a substantial part of its climate policy agenda? Uh, good question, Jeff. I, I, you know, what we know is based on what we've seen to date, or what we saw, I should say, from the Biden campaign, which explicitly, um, uh, made a set of commitments uh, within the context of, of their climate and clean energy policy proposals that uh, got to some degree of specificity. Um, and in fact, one of the commitments is noted here in a question from Bettina, hi Bettina, um, uh, it, which is a task force uh, on coal communities that I, I think was envisioned as, as lifting up local leaders who could actually advise uh, a Biden-Harris in administration uh, moving forward. Any, any thoughts that any of our panelists wanna have on that particular idea? 
uh, or on this question more broadly? I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, I, I think that there's genuine interest in, in solving the questions that, that we're posing here. Let me, let me just add from my own perspective that this to me addresses what uh, one of the issues we have to, to solve, right? It's not, it is about investment certainly, but it's also about governance, right? And, and the need uh, in an immensely complicated entity that is the federal government to, to have uh, a, a uh, institutionalized uh, function that coordinates uh, all, all the disparate programs of the federal government that could be brought to bear on this problem and also show some leadership. Um, and uh, what I know from my own experience is that it, it, you know, uh, under a Biden-Harris administration, it cannot rely on random staffers like say me, you know, being an enormous pain in the ass and calling federal agencies and trying to get them to cough up money or come to meetings at the White House. It's got to be uh, embedded within the functioning of the federal government. Um, all right, um, let me look to some more questions. Let me do a time check. We've got a few more minutes here. Uh, a couple of good and, and actually kind of challenging questions about uh, different technologies, including nuclear and carbon capture, and, and one that notes that in the IPCC report uh, on pathways to keep us under 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, carbon capture is considered, is cited as a necessary part of a broader set of uh, climate policies that are gonna be necessary to, 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 to keep us to 1.5 or below. Anyone wanna uh, comment, Jilla, I know we, we heard your opinion on, on carbon capture. You can certainly follow up on that, but but anyone else wanna comment on I this? would love to jump in here. Yeah. I um, I don't, I think the, the unsung, technological hero is something called combined heat and power. Um, it is just a much more efficient way to meet the heat and power needs of our manufacturing sector. I really don't believe that there is um, a manufacturing solution out there that's fossil fuel free. Um, we just need to figure out how to use our scarce resources wisely. Um, and in an environmentally friendly way. And, and I think anybody that uh, is familiar with combined heat and power technology um, gets super enthusiastic about the poten potential role it can play. Um, and I think headquartering that in the, um, by when I talk about repurposing our shuttered coal plant into eco industrial parks, the center stage of that is um, combined heat and power technology. I, I can jump in a little bit too there just to comment on the economics. So there are a couple questions about nuclear and the challenge for, for nuclear is, is in the economics, even if you could get past all the uh, you know, political and, and uh, regulatory burdens, it just takes so long to build a nuclear plant. Uh, and it, you know, you're, you've got a billion dollars invested for 10 years before you get your first kilowatt hour. So you compare that to the rapidity with which you can deploy um, the, the newer renewables and, and natural gas, it, nuclear, new nuclear can't compete. That said, there's a lot of interest in these small modular reactors. And so there's research going on in, in that area. And I think it remains to be seen what their economics are gonna be, but that, that might be one nuclear option that, that could, that could uh, contribute. The other thing about CCS, what we're seeing in the data and the, the modeling is that, you know, everybody likes the idea of carbon capture saving coal. But by the time we have a climate policy that's sufficiently ambitious for CCUS to be deployed, coal's already gone. Coal's, coal's gone. It comes in with natural gas and, and efficient natural gas. 
So, so those who think that coal is going to get saved by CCS, um, you know, may want to familiarize themselves with some of this uh, analysis so that, you know, they, they can keep a realistic perspective on that potential. There was one other question about whether exports could save coal. Well, exports are about, I mean, roughly 10% of our total you know, relative to coal consumption in the US. So I don't see any prospect of exports growing so much that it compensates for the decline in domestic consumption. Because remember what drives coal exports is demand and supply in the rest of the world. And so we're competing with countries who produce coal with better currency uh, exchange rates, with with lower cost production and transportation, all kinds of things. And I, I just don't see that being the thing that, that saves coal. So kind of the sooner we get over all these, you know, fantasies about how coal's going to get saved, I think the better. And then we can grapple with, with what's more likely to happen. Thank you, Adele. The, these, these are, of course, enormously complicated topics. I'll, I'll just make two very quick notes before passing it over to, to George, which, which is uh, on carbon capture, I, I think we need to have actually two, two different conversations. There, there's a conversation about carbon capture in the power sector, um, which is very different than a conversation about carbon capture in the industrial sector. Right? Yes, I'm um, talking about where, where we're using all the coal, exactly. which is in the power sector. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and some in the industrial sector, but more so natural gas. And, and then with respect to nuclear, it, you're right about, about new nuclear plants with, with, with your caveat about advanced reactors. But then there's also the issue, of course, of existing nuclear reactors, right? Many of which are on an economic bubble. We've already seen emissions go up in places where uh, existing reactors have retired prematurely. There's a whole conversation to be had there that unfortunately we just don't have time to get. You're through. absolutely right. Um, on that note, let me turn it back to you, George, to make uh, any closing comments. Thank you, Jason. And thank you all for this very timely and productive uh, conversation. We could, given the questions, we could easily go uh, for another hour. And I certainly would love to have a whole conversation devoted the question of mechanisms for the federal government actually funding uh, these programs if it happens, given that money given, going to directly to state governments often doesn't get to the people it needs to get to. And yet giving money directly to communities is an issue of the capacity to do that. So what are intermediate approaches like the Appalachian Regional, Regional Commission, which has been somewhat, I think, successful? But just one note before I uh, closed uh, from a comment from having spent the spring before last in, uh, in Germany and talking to people and the experience that the Germans had with their phase out of coal and the beginning of a transition. Over and over, I heard that what doesn't work is to try to bring big new manufacturing or industrial facilities into coal country and train people to do something they're not accustomed to doing that's brand new to the community. But what did work was for communities to get together and to be funded to get together and try to figure out what are the strengths of each individual community, even if they're not strong strengths, and then build on those strengths. So very much of a bottom-up strategy instead of a top-down strategy. That was an interesting observation I think you will find from, uh, from Europe. So again, thank you. Uh, several national organizations speaking to folks on this program who are uh, uh, local, uh, several national organizations, including the Partnership for Responsible Growth, National Wildlife Federation, uh, Reimagine Appalachia and the Just, the Just Transition Fund are all continue to be working to promote this dialogue. And I wanted to highlight again, three documents. I think they're on your chat function uh, uh, links on the chat function, which are uh, hopefully very useful resources. One is the Coal Country Source Book authored by the partnership and NWF I spoke about before. Uh, a second is the Reimagine Appalachia uh, a program document, which uh, Amanda spoke about. 
And the third is a, a document called National Economic Transition Platform for Coal Communities developed by a very broad coalition of groups that was um, catalyzed by uh, Just Transition Fund and Heidi Binko. Those are all very valuable resource documents. So I'd like to thank uh, Zainab uh, Weronen, uh, Peter Gonzalez, Linda Lance, and Kelsey Foran for their work in organizing today's events. Uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, watch this event or share it with a colleague, it will be catched on the Atlanta Council website and there's a YouTube version. And uh, for those of you who are interested in continuing to look at uh, Atlanta Council, uh, Global Energy Center uh, product. The registration is open to for a Atlanta Council Global Energy Forum uh, to be held virtually in January. And you can find that on the website. So thank you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope we can continue this conversation.